the pair found an ad posted by a Charlene Bosma on Kijiji trying to sell her husband Tim Bosma's black Dodge Ram. In case you don't know what KGG is, guys, it's literally the equivalent of Craigslist or fake Facebook Marketplace. It's just a place where people go to sell things. Bosma was born on August 12th, 1980, and he was only 32 years old at the time of his disappearance and murder. So he's really young, just a young guy. Arlene and uh, Tim actually lived in a small town in Ancaster, Ontario, um, with their two-year-old daughter at the time. They were hoping to expand their family, and selling this truck was meant to be a way of kind of loosening their restrictions financially on them um, so that they could actually afford to expand their family and they were really excited for what the future held. Ellen and Mark made an appointment with Tim on May 13th and they were supposed to meet him in the early evening to go on a test drive in the truck that he was selling. However, it was really weird because they kept pushing back the time later and later and Tim Bosma began to grow a bit suspicious. He thought it was really weird that they were coming so late because by the time they arrived, it was around 9 p.m. that night and it was super late. But it was really weird that their time was getting pushed back later and later because who wants to drive at night for a test drive? That's really weird. So he actually approached his wife, Charlene, and asked her when they arrived, should I go in the truck with them? And Charlene said something that's probably going to haunt her for the rest of her life. Um, at the time, her biggest concern was the truck getting stolen because she's thinking like that's the worst case scenario. What if someone takes the truck? So she told Tim, you should go in the truck with them. We want the truck to come back. Those words are going to haunt her for the rest of her life. And I think that's why this case really sits with a lot of people is because we all had that idea of like what we could have done differently, what we could have said differently. And we have so many regrets. And this situation is like our worst nightmare. Like, can you imagine thinking back to like, I made him go in the truck. I made him go. Like she probably has so many regrets and I genuinely like my, my heart goes out to her. They finally arrived, Dylan and Mark on foot. They ended up showing up to the driveway around 9 p.m. on May 13th. Um, Charlene thought it was really weird. She was like, did you guys get dropped? Like what happened? Like, where's your car? And they were like, oh, we got dropped off. Like a friend dropped us off for the test drive, which already some alarm bells are going off because why would you get dropped off here like is it like wouldn't you need someone to come back and pick you up then afterwards so clearly it was a one-way trip three men then went and got in the truck and charlene never saw her husband again after sending multiple texts and trying to call tim a number of times with no response charlene put a missing persons report out for tim immediately the case was a devastating blow to the community um genuinely just like devastating and there was a huge social media campaign trying to find Tim Bosma trying to find out anything about where he went everybody was on the lookout for Tim everybody felt so heartbroken and felt so terrible for what Charlene must be feeling with her husband missing and how much blame she was placing on herself police were quick to determine that the phone that had been used to contact Tim regarding the test drive was actually a burner phone. May 8th, at a news conference, Charlene let out a heartbreaking plea begging the kidnappers to return her husband. She just wanted him back. She said it was just a stupid truck. Like, she didn't need the truck. They could take the truck, but they didn't need him. She needed him. Her daughter needed him. And it was just the most heartbreaking news conference I've ever seen in my life. Like, it was genuinely so horrible. Like you can't imagine the grief and the guilt she must felt. Ugh. Using the call records from the phone, the police were quick to determine that the kidnappers had actually made two other appointments for test driving vehicles that were similar to the one Tim was selling um, to, before they had met up with Tim. The first test drive that they had scheduled, they failed to show up on time for, so it ended up being canceled. The day before Tim's disappearance, the pair had actually made a test drive appointment for another vehicle on May 5th and they ended up showing up on time for that appointment. Through this, the police were able to meet with the seller that had met with the kidnappers the day before when they were checking out the other vehicle for a test drive. So they were able to meet with him and he actually gave a really good description of the assailants and they matched the description that Charlene Bosma had given the police as well. So they knew they had their guys. Um, and they also got some additional details from the seller who actually said that he, they one of the guys was holding a satchel bag and he had a tattoo on his wrist that said ambition and it was in a box. Police released this information to the public hoping that they could get some positive leads on the abductors. May 10th Tim's phone was found in Brantford, Ontario by police which is approximately 29 kilometers away from where he was abducted. Same day on May 10th, 
uh, Peel and Toronto Regional Police ended up contacting Hamilton Police to let them know that a Toronto man named Dylan Millard was known to carry around a small satchel bag and had a tattoo on his wrist that said the word ambition on it. As a result, on May 11, 2013, approximately five days after Tim went missing, Police were able to stop Dylan Millard at a stop sign in Mississauga and they were able to box in his vehicle. Police Sergeant Stuart Oxley approached Dylan's vehicle with his gun raised and got a positive identification from Dylan. Dylan immediately put his hands up and was like, that's me. Once Dylan identified himself, police quickly arrested him and he was charged with forcible confinement and theft of $5,000 relating to Tim Bosma's disappearance. At the scene, they found Tim Bosma's keys in Dylan's vehicle. Next day on May 12th, police were able to locate Tim Bosma's vehicle and they found it located in a trailer that belonged to Dylan on his mother's property. Unfortunately, the vehicle was completely stripped and they found gun residue and blood remaining in the truck. Dylan's fingerprints were all over the vehicle, so there was no way he could claim that he was not involved in Tim's disappearance. Human remains were later found on Dylan's farm in the incinerator. However, the DNA was too charred for them to make a positive connection to Tim Bosma. However, at this point, they weren't afraid to say that Tim was now deceased. Dylan's charges were then upgraded to first-degree murder charges. Even more evidence was mounting against Dylan when it was found that he had actually texted all of his employees, instructed them not to show up at the airport hangar the day after Tim's disappearance. It stated during Tim Bosma's murder trial that Dylan had actually contacted a body shop that he normally worked with on May 8th, just a couple days after Tim's disappearance. He had contacted the owner of the body shop saying he needed a really quick job done. He actually wanted to repaint the truck that he had purchased that was black to red. And just so you guys are all aware, the truck that Tim was selling was a black Dodge Ram. So he was trying to paint a black Dodge Ram red. So super suspicious. He ended up calling it off last minute because I guess he realized like, yeah, this is too sketch. This case has been too renowned. A lot of people know about it. If I paint this truck, it's going to look really weird. So he ended up backing out of it at the last minute, but the body shop owner did not forget this request. He thought it was very weird and he'd never received a request from Dylan before in their previous working together. He would never received a request to get a job done fast by him. So I thought that was really weird. Shortly after his arrest for Tim Bosma's disappearance, police began to put the pieces together and realized that there were two other unsettling cases that they had looked into in recent months um, that had one thing in common. Dylan. They both, he knew both of them. One of them was his father who passed away very suddenly. It was very strange. And then Laura Babcock was his ex-girlfriend. So I thought that was very strange because if he has these connection to these other two individuals who passed away suddenly, is it really that weird for them to assume that he was involved in it when he actually murdered a stranger for no reason? It was quickly determined that Dylan did not act alone. Uh, Mark Smith was always by his side and was most likely to be involved in the disappearance also of Tim Bosma and Laura Babcock. It was Mark who went on a test drive in Tim Bosma's truck. It was also Mark who helped plan the murder of Laura Babcock. He also supplied an alibi for Dylan when his father suddenly passed away. There was too many pieces coming together and a lot of them were making a lot of sense. So police immediately were like, this is weird, we need to investigate this further. After approximately a week of surveillance, Mark Smith was also arrested on first degree murder charges of Laura Babcock and Tim Bosma on May 22nd, 2013. In Tim Bosma's trial, Mark and Dylan were quick to blame the other for the disappearance and murder of Tim Bosma. Mark went so far as to contest that he was actually in a totally separate vehicle following behind Dylan when Dylan and Tim went on the test drive. So it was actually Dylan who killed Tim uh, when they were on the test drive because he wasn't even in the vehicle, which what an idiot because Charlene literally saw you guys walk up to the house and you said you got dropped off. So like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, Mark. Regardless of what Mark actually testified, he was always adamant that he was not the one who killed Tim Bosma. He was adamant that it was actually Dylan who pulled the trigger and he was only there to clean up the murder. Mark was adamant that he was in a totally different vehicle when Tim was abducted. Dylan's lawyer was actually stating that all three of them were in the truck that night. Dylan was driving, Tim was in the passenger seat, and Mark was in the back seat. 
and everything was going fine until Mark came and pulled out a gun and said that this was a robbery. They were going to steal the vehicle. A struggle quickly ensued, and then Tim was shot and murdered. So it was actually Mark that pulled the trigger. So ultimately, they're both blaming each other for the murder and abduction of Tim. Ultimately, both cowards pleaded not guilty. They were not ready to own up to their mistakes, own up to the heinous acts they did, um, and they were just pleading dumb. They were like, oh, we don't, we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything wrong. It was the other guy. Arlene Bosma, who is Tim's wife, she was incredibly strong during this whole trial. She is actually the Crown's first witness, and she spoke on the events of that night of May 6th when her husband was taken away from her. She spoke very candidly, very beautifully about her situation and how these men had destroyed her life, basically. And they had so much proof, they had so much evidence against these guys that there was no way I can imagine the jury saying, saying, yeah, they're not guilty. So Charlene did a really great job. She thankfully had a really supportive friends and family who came to each day of the court hearings. And it was, she really did her best, honestly. It became clear that nobody believed what Dellen and Mark were saying, and they were finally convicted on first-degree murder charges in June of 2016. Thankfully, they were given life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for 25 years, and these they were going to be serving it consecutively, so it going to be consecutively at least 25 years for the murder of Tim Bosma. When the guilty verdict was read, Dellen Millard had the audacity to look at Charlene Bosma and shake his head. He had a lot of audacity and is a horrible human being. He has no remorse for what he has done and the pain he has caused. Following the guilty verdict, Mark's lawyer stated that there were strong grounds to appeal the guilty verdict, which I strongly disagree. It wasn't until April of 2014 that Dellen and Mark were charged with first-degree murder for Laura Babcock's disappearance. During their sentencing at Laura Babcock's trial, the jury was not made aware of the fact that the pair had been related or connected to the Tim Bosma case, that they had already been charged for first degree murder for his disappearance and death. And they were also not aware of the fact that Dylan was going through his, thir his third round of first degree murder charges for the murder of his father, Wayne Millard, which was still going through court. So they were not aware of either of these cases um, in order to offer a fair trial to the Plains. Clearly that did not work in the pair's favor as they were officially convicted of her murder in 2017 and given an additional life sentence, life imprisonment sentence for her murder that would be sentenced consecutively. Um, so they wouldn't be able to go for parole for another 25 years. So they were going to be not able to go for parole for at least 50 years to try and get out sooner. I'd also like to point out that Christina Noja, who was Dellen Millard's girlfriend prior to all of this, she was also convicted of obstructing justice and destroying evidence relating to Tim Bosma's murder and disappearance in 2016. She charged that because she was involved in tampering evidence in favor of her boyfriend. I just want to be clear that yes, Dellen Millard and Mark Smith are monsters, but they're not the only monsters in this case. Christina Noja was just as guilty in a lot of ways, and many say that that's why he ended up killing Laura Babcock was because of her ongoing feud with Laura Babcock. Christina played a role in it too. Like clearly she didn't wasn't the one that murdered Laura, but she also was aware of the situation and did nothing, did not contact the police or anything. So she's just as involved in my eyes. And she's also a monster. For close to a year after his arrest, it was found that Dylan was actually sending letters to Christina Noja, actually giving her a detailed script on what to tell police relating to Laura Babcock's disappearance. So he basically told her that, oh, uh, make sure to tell the police that the last time we saw Laura Babcock, she was in the basement doing coke with Mark Smitch. And when we saw her, she was alive. So we told her to say that to police. He gave her an entire script to say so that he and her would not be found connected to the case and not involved in her disappearance or murder. And he would also make a point of noting to her to destroy the letter so there'd be no evidence against him. So super suspicious. And Christina Noja being the clown that she is, she did not destroy the letters. She would keep them and 
this is ultimately how it came to public view. Like this is how it ultimately came to the public's awareness and our creative conscious that these two people are scum. He ended up messaging her all of that and she ended up writing him back nice little loving notes where she called him her sweet serial killer. Yuck. So yeah, they were both as bad, terrible people. And yeah, so eventually when police went and looked into Christina Noja and her involvement in Tim Posma's evidence being disrupted, that's when they found these letters and saw how Dellen was trying to manipulate the situation and point the blame more in Mark Smith's direction than him. It was actually in April of 2014 that she was charged as an accessory in Laura's murder and disappearance, but she ended up accepting a lesser guilty charge of being an obstructor of justice for tampering with evidence because she didn't want to be known as an accessory and go to jail and she wanted a lesser sentence. So that's why she did that because she was originally going to be recognized as an accessory to her murder. Lovely. Christina Noja, you're a terrible person. January of 2018, Matthew Ward Jackson was sentenced to 11 years of imprisonment for being convicted on nine charges related to gun possession and trafficking, which he pleaded guilty to. If you remember correctly, Matthew Ward Jackson was actually the guy who sold the weapons to Dylan uh, illegally, which he ended up using to kill Tim Bosma and Wayne Millard, and I'm also assuming Laura Babcock as well. Finally, in September of 2018, Delenn Millard was actually charged for the first degree murder of his father. So it wasn't a suicide, he ended up murdering his father for whatever reason he had. Sentenced to his third life term without the possibility of parole, so he's going to be serving this consecutively and he won't be able to go for parole for approximately 75 years, so he will never get out of prison. Thank God, because most of these rich boys we hear about that are committing these horrible crimes, we always hear them getting out of it because they have money. But in the situation, he will not be able to get out of jail and he's going to have to live with what he has done. It was claimed during Wayne's trial that although Dylan actually acted as the dutiful son in public, he had a really ongoing tense relationship with his father and would buckle under the expectations his father had for him. Employees at Millard Air also spoke of the fact that Dylan was supposed to be getting cut off because of his extravagant spending. So. He was going to obviously be very resentful towards his father for cutting him off like that. One fun fact for you all is that Canadian law does not allow criminals to profit from their crimes. So if Dylan ever gets out of prison, which he won't, hopefully, um, he will be completely disinherited and will not have profited from his murderous reign. So obviously that's a lot to digest. That was a lot of horrible shit that went down. Those people are horrible human beings, like horrible, horrible. I genuinely think anybody that was involved with Dylan and Mark and had heard about what was going on because it sounds like Mark had a big mouth and they didn't speak to the police, like shame on you, honestly. There were so many people that were just compliant with the situation, that didn't say anything, that just went along with it. And it was the bystander effect. They just didn't say anything to police. A lot of people didn't come forward and a lot less people could have been hurt if somebody had come forward and not just stood by and watched this happen. So I'm going to talk about the aftermath of this and try and touch on some lighter notes, hopefully, for all of you. 2016, Charlene Bosma, who is Tim Bosma's wife, um, she ended up founding a charity organization in the Hamilton-Wentworth area of Ontario called Tim's Tribute. This charity aims to assist families that have lost loved ones to homicide. So they're hoping to help families with their immediate needs, whether it's through groceries, uh, through transportation, or by offering legal fees, like helping assist with legal fees. Um, so there is a really beautiful charity organization that she created to try and help all these people after going through what she did and seeing what it's like trying to battle these things and the legal fees. She almost lost her home. If she hadn't have gotten help from her community, she probably wouldn't have been able to keep her home. So she knows how much it costs and how frustrating it is. So she was trying to create this organization with hope that she could help a lot of families that were suffering already the loss of a loved one, but also were suffering financially because of the costs of trying to take these criminals to court. So she really did a beautiful thing. She created Tim's Tribute and 
unfortunately the organization has actually been a, needed a lot more than she expected it would be. She only thought, expected to see a few cases a year, but since its origin four years ago or almost five years ago, she has already helped about 40 people and she's been involved in at least 40 cases, which is a lot more than she anticipated to be dealing with. So it has been a real financial strain. So if you guys ever had the means to or ever want to help out at all, please check down the link below. I actually posted Tim's Tributes link for the website down below. If by any chance you want to donate or recommend it to anybody or anything like that, um, just so you're aware, if you want to research the company at all, the organization, sorry, at all. Um, but yeah, like she did a really beautiful thing and she's honestly the, such a strong woman. Like I don't, I can't even imagine what she's gone through and she created this organization and she's doing really well. I'm really proud of her. Actually on a lighter note, which is really good, um, she's actually since changed her name. So she's not Charlene anymore. She wanted to stay out of the public eye and she actually remarried. She ended up remarrying uh, one of Tim's best friends. It was actually a groomsman at their wedding. Um, they never expected to connect the way they did, but it was because he was going through a really bad divorce and she had just gone through the loss of her husband and they ended up coming into each other's lives and supporting each other and healing together and they ended up getting married. So I hope she's doing well. She's 40 years old now and I'm really hoping the best for her. Like, I'm glad she met someone who's able to understand her and support her because he's also gone through the loss of Tim as well because they were such good friends. So that's a good news at least. There wasn't as much to be found about Laura Babcock's family. Um, the only thing that's been more of an update recently is that they finally got her death certificate in 2019. Um, because her body had been incinerated by those monsters, uh, they were able, weren't able to declare her as dead by the state. So like the, the province wasn't able to provide the family with the death certificate, which was horrible because the thing with a death certificate is like you're still getting constant reminders you're already trying to go move on and like grieve the loss of your daughter of your sister and they would keep getting mail from companies from the government that had her name on it and that would probably trigger them i imagine like they still were getting her mail-in ballots for voting for the election and stuff like that like it was terrible so they finally got her death certificate so they were finally able to lay her to rest thank goodness that's the worst thing about this case is that all these bodies these two bodies were just sinner like they were incinerated so they were never able to lay their loved ones to rest and that means a lot to a lot of people and they weren't able to do that and there's a lot to be said in that you know so that's all of that guys um i really hope you enjoyed hearing this case and i hope maybe you've learned something new about it. I really did research this case quite a bit because there was so much to it. There was so much I find with the new age with text messages and stuff like that. There's so many ways people can communicate to one another and a lot of criminals are communicating back and forth to one another. So there's so much evidence against these perpetrators in this case. So there's so much evidence that I could collect and I kept finding more and more things out that I felt were important to the case and made it more interesting. So it's interesting what's going to be coming in the next like how many years because there's always going to be terrible people that commit these atrocities unfortunately and it's weird to think about how social media and technology has really changed the game with that and how evidence is going to be collected but yeah that being said i really hope you guys enjoyed this video um my deepest condolences go to laura babcock's family um to wayne millard's girlfriend and his family and also to Tim Bosma. I'm so sorry for your loss and I hope one day you can find peace. Um, thank you so much guys for watching. Have a good day. Bye.